Good morning, Chris. How are you? Good morning, Steve. Great. How are you? <laughs> Where are you right at the moment? I'm in Prince Hooford. Uh, as you can see, my kitchen's behind me. <laughs> and uh, and uh, in which traditional territory are you in as well? I'm in the traditional territory of the Coast Sipshian. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and I am in the traditional territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish First Nations. Uh, and it's great that we're able to connect this way. You know, uh, the, the point of this talk, of course, is to, is to talk about what is the value of partnerships for everybody uh, to uh, create opportunity, to stimulate the economy, to build relationships that are respectful and where uh, we are working together. And, you know, yesterday you and I had a chat before we were going to get started, and you said this is the way to true reconciliation. What do you mean by that? Why is it through economic partnerships? Partnerships that you believe that this is how we find true reconciliation? Well, you know, Stuart, for me, um, relationships are everything. And uh, it's important that we create certainty, not just for our people, but uh, industry needs certainty as well, that, uh, that when they're walking into our territories, they know that we're working together. Um, I've always said together we're stronger. And I really think that there's a real opportunity to start uh, working on commercial agreements, uh, attacking these opportunities by region by region, uh, and slowly come together as a people. Uh, we say we want to reconcile with government, we want to reconcile with industry, but I think what a lot of people are forgetting is that we also need to reconcile with ourselves and with each other and our neighbors in order for us to come together. Um, I remember um, uh, Marie Sinclair mentioning that reconciliation was going to be messy, it was going to be ugly, it was going to be tough, there's going to be a lot of really tough uh, conversations that are going to need to happen, and he's right. Um, I, I, I've always said uh, at our leadership table that I help um, start with a, with, a, with a coastal leader that the tough conversations is what's going to get us over the finish line. The tough conversations is what get us to where we need to be. Without those tough conversations, we are have a very difficult time moving forward. So you got to address the problem head on. I've always believed that I, I, I've never been one to shy away from difficult issues. I think in order for us to, to prosper as a people uh, so that we can move forward uh, as Canadians, um, we need to work together, but we also we have to reconcile with one another in order for us to achieve that success. You know, I, I had to laugh just a little bit when you said you're you're never one to shy away from tough conversations, and it's so true. There are sometimes I go, "Wow, okay, you, you you turn your you know your face into the wind and and hit it head on." But when you talk about tough uh, conversations, what are some of those topics that you know that everybody who says well, we want to create a partnership, what are those topics that we have to understand and then find a way to work out? Uh, you know, what the challenges might be so that we can have a common goal? Well, I mean, overlap seems to be one of the big ones. Um, as you know, uh, many of our communities want to achieve free prior and informed consent. But through that process, what happens is uh, there's overlap of territory. It could be traditional hunting grounds. It could be uh, trap lines. It could be overlap just in, uh, with uh, mixed territory within tribes. Uh, and those are the, one of the main issues I find that need to be discussed uh, because uh, what I find where I'm from, uh, there, there's uh, our community has never moved our boundaries. And it's really important that if neighboring communities want to work with uh, my community, such as Lako Lambs, uh, they need to come in and have that discussion with leadership. You know, historically, when we talked about the hereditary, when we talked about how we want to implement that process uh, a long time ago, a neighboring community would have to ask permission to come in to, to come into the territory. I don't see why it won't be any different um, now. Um, but what's happened is uh, the government has made some changes. Uh, as you know, most recently uh, was the new environmental assessment process. I don't believe that's the right way to go. And because the reason I don't believe that's the way to go is because I really believe you're forcing the hand of those impacted communities that have a number of industry players that want to come in and do business with them. So how is it fair to the impacted community that say is way north versus a community that is central coast 
and and that community may have a say over the process of how something is done right in our backyard and when when you take a look at the corridor that's happening everything is heading north to alaska and out to international markets uh it's no secret that prince Rupert is going to be the future of the low carbon low, low carbon port but how can you justify a community that is central coast or further uh they have the ability to intervene into a process that does not impact them. That's what I'm trying to understand. What, where, where, where I see this going is, is nothing but lawsuits and litigation. Um, I don't think that's the right foot to start off on. Uh, where I think communities should do is that if you really truly want to talk about reconciliation, I always hear uh, leaders talk about, we need to go back to the old ways. Now, Granted, we can't go back in time. However, we could take lessons learned from the past that if a community wants to do business with communities that have these economic opportunities, why not ask permission to sit down with leadership, break bread, talk about what your concerns are, talk about common interests, political risk, and a path forward. But when you have a government that wants to enforce a particular process, on groups of communities that do have these economic opportunities, I don't think that's the right path to go. I really believe so, it's going to be difficult. So you believe that these are tough conversations that have to happen within First Nations first. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, look, at the end of the day, we know that there are communities in Canada, uh, there are communities on the coast that don't otherwise have these economic opportunities in their backyard. Um, some of them somewhat do, most of them do not. When you take a look at the Heisla, Lakwa Lambs, and Matlakatla and Nanishka, we're getting inundated with these opportunities in the resource sector with oil, gas, hydrogen, uh, I mean, everything from goods and services, and we're right along the transportation corridor. Um, I really believe that there's a real good opportunity here for Indigenous communities to break bread with the communities on the coast, and I keep saying this, that I think it's, it's about time that the communities that want to do business in areas that are going to be economically impacted, I really believe they should start setting up these meetings with the communities that are impacted by economic development. Like, for example, Port Expansion here in Prince Super. All these opportunities that are coming our way, there's a great opportunity to, to build a commercial opportunity with neighboring communities. It's complex, though, because if if let's say you start with that first those First Nations uh, working out and, and working their way through these tough conversations, you're still interacting with other levels of government, uh, whether they're local, provincial or federal, all with different ideas about uh, the way that they think that uh, our future should unfold. Then you also have to bring in the economic partners, which are usually large. Uh, especially if we're talking about energy projects, large multinational companies. This process, as you say, is going to be tough and it's going to be long. How, are you able to give some kind of a timeline to people who say, okay, this is what I have to anticipate as we start to move into this process, hoping that through it, I'm going to come out with, as you pointed out earlier, uh, certainty, because that's what uh, everybody wants to have. Well, look, uh, as you know, uh, for Indigenous people don't like to put timelines on things. But right. uh, but what what I've learned in my, my days of being elected and working with industry is that the support needs to go towards the Indigenous communities to come up with a process that's achievable. Um, we can't go on blind dates, right? We, we need to understand where we're at what the middle looks like and where the end goal is. So I think this is the greatest opportunity for indigenous, indigenous communities to come up with a, with the permitting process, the engagement process in the environmental monitoring uh, implementation of how, how do we grow the economy while we protect the environment. I think this is the greatest opportunity for indigenous people to put that in play. So by doing that, uh, you do that internally with the respected nation that are in, that is impacted. And then if a community wants to come in and do business or work with those communities that have those opportunities, I think this is the greatest opportunity to come in and request a meeting, ask how we could uh, be a partner or be a player or have an opportunity. Because look, let's let's be honest here. Like, uh, there's a lot of communities that don't have those economic uh, opportunities in front of them. And I always said it's always about the opportunity. So I think this is a this is a great time to demonstrate reconciliation. As I keep saying, 
I know we can't go back to the past. We have to continue to move forward. But there are guiding principles that we can take from our hereditary uh, leadership. There are guiding principles we could take from the history of our culture. Is that how do we get involved? Let's ask permission to meet with leadership and see how best we could potentially work together. Well, you're right that we're at a very interesting point in Canadian history where our First Nations partners really are the people who hold the key to economic prosperity. Uh, we see uh, the UNDRIP uh, legislation that was introduced in British Columbia. We see Bill C-15. The feds are uh, on the verge of probably enacting. Um, you know, uh, the, and and this growing understanding, you know, Bill Gallagher in his book, Resource Rulers, points out that virtually every single land claims case that goes to court is another win for a First Nation. And that when business, government and First Nations can work together, we all prosper. Uh, and, 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 and so this truly is uh, a really very interesting and powerful moment in Canadian history. To that end, you are working with a group called C to C to C. Tell us, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a group of uh, former executives and business owners uh, that have decided to come together to talk about how best can we create certainty for industry in this country, but not only industry, but how do we pre uh, create certainty for Indigenous communities? Uh, when we take a look at Newfoundland, the British Columbia, the Churchill, there's a great opportunity where Indigenous people can play a key role in this unity corridor. And I, we say unity corridor because it's about bringing us together. It's about having an opportunity for these communities along this uh, corridor unite and be a part of the Canada's economic engine. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say now in today's economy that if a big business is going to come, it's going to come and they're going to do business with Indigenous communities. I think this is the way to do it. Um, you know, it's it, it's going to be a big uh, it's going to be a big elephant to take on, but uh, you know how do you eat an elephant? You you bite it one bite at a time, and uh, we start connecting with those communities that are that are interested. The other thing is that we we talked about is that we talked about how can we bring much needed capacity to indigenous communities across the country. Uh, I think there's a, a, a great opportunity to get access to capital. Uh, there's the opportunity to get into, get access to grant funding for this. And I think there's this time where you could bring people along. You know, one of the biggest one of the biggest challenge our communities always have is is capacity. You know, I, I think it's about time that our communities start moving forward and start building capacity within. But one of the things that we we constantly do is we constantly go to consulting firms or we go to somebody from the outside because the communities lack the capacity to take on these initiatives that are being proposed, whether it's economic, whether it's social housing, whether it's infrastructure. But if we don't start taking a chance on our own members to build that capacity, we're still going to be in that 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 uh, that path where we're not building no capacity. So I think what indigenous leaders and communities need to start recognizing is that when you bring on a consultancy firm, some of the things that they should be focusing on is how do we mentor local indigenous communities from the said nation that they're working with so that in 10, 15 years or so that they they or five, five to seven years or so, they'll know how to take on these much uh, take on these important projects. I want to give a shout out to Jennifer Hooper at Sauter School of Business right now because she has developed a First Nations uh, a degree program to help uh, people in communities, just as you're talking about, uh, understand, appreciate, analyze all these opportunities and then uh, make informed decisions on the best way to move forward for, for that nation. Uh, because you're right, uh, people need to be uh, equipped with the tools that are going to allow them to make the uh, appropriate kind of de decisions. You know, uh, on the weekend, I don't know if you saw or maybe it was late last week, the Toronto stock market or the TMX uh, came out and basically what wholeheartedly said, invest in indigenous businesses and communities. Does this give you the sense that, you know, we truly are moving uh, towards that kind of reconciliation that you think is so fundamentally important? A hundred percent. Look, it, it's not gonna happen overnight. Uh, I always go back to under Bill C-15. Uh, the length of time that bill's gonna take to implement is about 10 to 15 years, where it's truly implemented into Canadian law. Uh, but 
in order for anything to move, you always want to make sure that you have First Nation communities as your partner. I think it's it, it's high time now that they're not just uh, looking at impact benefit agreements. They're actually becoming actual true equity partners, ownership into the said project, whatever that may look like. Uh, you know, for years I kept hearing our community saying we want to get away from depending on government dollars. Well, here's your opportunity to start generating sole source revenues back to your own community. When you take a look at the BC Hydro lines and all the pipelines and all those uh, wonderful utilities that we have in this country to heat our homes, to provide a good living for our people, this is the time to do it, is where we could start to get a percentage of those opportunities. I, that's, I, I really believe that's, when we look at these global opportunities, that's going to be the path that this country is going to go. You know, there are some people who look at UNDRIP and, and Bill C-15 and they go, oh my gosh, okay, well, that means that one, uh, you know, a, a First Nation has uh, the veto rights over a particular project. But it, I, I, when I listen to you speak, Chris, I get the sense that you're saying uh, those uh, pieces of legislation become immaterial when you're working in partnership with somebody because you're already working towards a common goal. A am I hearing you correctly? Yeah, look, I, I, I know in our community um, and others that I've worked with, that I continue to work with, these leaders have always said, we need to work with our neighbors. We need to start coming together and how best we can work together. Where it goes south real quick is when other communities start to infringe on the rights and title of the community that is impacted with these opportunities that are in their back door. When you start to mix commercial and rights and title, that's where things go wrong. Um, I can tell you, as a as a as a band member of Lock Lands, and as a former counselor, our people will never agree to stuff like that. So when communities, other leaders, or communities look at places like Lock Lands or or Metlakatla or the Heisla, they need to understand that those leaders are under immense pressure on to protect the inherent rights of our band members, and that's the land, the resources, everything around it. So it, you, when you start to talk about land in question or, or claiming land, that's where the conversation ends. But mm -hmm. if the community truly wants to work with a community that has these massive global opportunities in front of them, I would sit down and ask to break bread and start that relationship and start talking about how best we could, could work together. What are the synergies? What are the concerns? What are the common interests? And how do we move forward together? But as soon as you start talking about claiming lands, that's where it ends. That's, and I just, I'm, I'm speaking from experience. I've seen this on a thousand times where there's a golden opportunity to work together with neighboring communities. And as soon as that comes into question, it ends there. And they need to get away from that and start looking at this as a commercial opportunity with the impacted communities for resource development or whatever that may be, fish, forestry, right. whatever that may look like for that community. So it may not be another First Nation that is also saying, hang on a second, I have a particular interest in your territory. There are NGOs, and you and I have had this conversation, that come in and say, well, hang on a second, I think that this is the way that you should uh, should manage it. Now, does that is that contrary to the concept of partnership? Uh, and, and, and I know that it causes you uh, great concern. Uh, no, um, look. It's no secret that I have no, uh, there is no love loss for me when it comes to uh, uh, interest uh, funded. You know, these interest groups that fund these NGOs, both locally and afar, um, I think it's, it, it's about time that both the federal and provincial governments start to understand that Indigenous communities are fed up with that. Um, they're fed up with the NGOs coming in and interfering and trying to have a say, trying to have a seat and a say at the very table we've been fighting for for the last 150 years. Uh, I will continue to oppose that. I, I don't think that it's right. I think that if, if the community wants to work with someone like an NGO, I think that that NGO, considering the amount of money they get, should be pouring those resources into just developing capacity, whether it's in band administration, finance, uh, education, 
maybe even some small infrastructure projects. If you really want to help us move forward in this country to achieve prosperity, that's where their focus should be. By trying to intervene in the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency or the BCEAO process, you're not doing the province a favor whatsoever. And you're not doing the impact at First Nation a favor whatsoever. Clearly, an unbelievable example of that was the Pachida on, on Vancouver Island where they have said enough is enough you need to leave our challenges to ourselves and let us get on with prosperity in this country so we could be a part of canada and not apart from canada you know uh out of uh, your objective really is through reconciliation economic reconciliation is to create opportunities like and as you pointed out in some territories there are those opportunities and, and in others there are not but Ultimately, those opportunities hopefully get shared down to the average person in every community so that they can uh, self-realize, so that they can have a job, so that they can earn money. I, I, I recently had a conversation with uh, Chief Clarence Louie from uh, the Associates Indian Band, and he says, look, the, thing, the most important thing for me is to be able to give somebody the opportunity to have a job, to get a paycheck, so that they have control over their own lives. They're not beholden to somebody else who's going to give them money. And this is so fundamentally important. And, and would you agree with that, Chris? <laughs> Look, I, I mean, I've always said, and I, I agree. I, first of all, I do agree with that statement. Uh, but what I, and again, from my own experience, is when a person has a job, they are demonstrating the ability to be independent. And from there, you start to take control of your own future. You start to buy a house. You start to buy a car. You get to go on trips. You put clothes in the kids in your backs. You put food in your kids' tummies. You put a roof over your head. That is an unbelievable opportunity to clearly demonstrate to your kids of what the what a role model looks like. I, I when when people say that stuff to me, the only people I want to be a role model to is my children. I don't want to be considered a role model to anybody else because I have many flaws. I have made many mistakes. And I've always said, if I had a nickel for every bad decision I made, I'd be a very wealthy man. <laughs> and so, uh, so again, I, I, I always say, like, let's talk about money. Let's talk about much needed revenues that need to come in to help our kids. Never shy away from the topic of money. Money isn't the problem. It's what you do with it that could be the problem. So, but look, and I, and I always say that money will never make you happy, but let me tell you something. I've been able to provide a pretty good life for my children. Uh, and I've done everything I can to make sure that was first and foremost, but I also want them to understand the value of a dollar. You know, you talk about being a role model for your children. Yesterday when we spoke in, in advance of this conversation, you said that to you, uh, it will be in some ways a, a glorious moment when you are referred to as a Canadian businessman, not as an in indigenous or an indigenous Canadian man. Why is it important to you that we drop that uh, uh, qualifier of you being indigenous and just say, you're a businessman? Well, you know, it was a colonial term. Uh, you know, it, I, I mean, I am Canadian. I, I'm just much like any other Canadian in this country. I, I live and breathe in Canada, and I don't see why not. I can't just be called a Canadian businessman. Um, I think in some regards, it's, I mean, it doesn't uh, bother some people, but I think some people find it patronizing. But, I mean, the average Canadian is called a Canadian businessman. We don't need to, I don't, I, I hope one day I'm not called an Indigenous businessman. But more importantly, I hope my kids, uh, if they ever venture down the road of business uh, or whatever that may look like, that they're just referred to as a Canadian. An Indigenous person that was born into the land, but as a Canadian, I'm a businessman. Yes, you are. And you're doing incredibly well. I see you popping up everywhere. Like people want to know your opinions there. You're, uh, you're, you're working deals everywhere. How many different companies do you have in play right at the moment? There's four different uh, opportunities that are coming about. Look, I, I always tell people Blackfish Enterprise is more of the flow through. Um, I, I, I self-financed a lot of my own money and capital. Um, some say that would be crazy. Um, others said that, well, I think that's not a bad approach, uh, but there, there are bigger fish to fry that I'm going after. Um, I, I have an unbelievable team and business partners in our heavy civil. We have a great finance guy. Uh, we have great operators. 
Uh, I have a the consultancy firm where if I'm going to team up with anybody, I'll hire anybody that has the same views as me. You don't have to be Indigenous, but if you fit the bill and you see the sports side of what we see for the country and for our people, hey, let's talk. But um, it's not all the time. I'm just going to flat out say yes because we have something in common. But um, at the end of the day, it's it's about how do we move our people and country forward together. Whether you are Indigenous or not, I mean, we're all we're all Canadians, and together we're stronger. I think it's really key. I think it's about time we start working together. I, I agree with you. Now, you know, Chris, there's probably going to be some people who have not met you who are watching right now going, hang on a second, how do I get in touch with that guy? So uh, why don't you share with us uh, the name of your company and how they can find you, especially if they want to do deals? Uh, well, I, I'm on LinkedIn quite a bit. Uh, but I mean, you could always uh, look at our website or whatever. You either go to Blackfish Industries, Blackfish Enterprises. Uh, I'm also on bitcrew.ca. But um, really, if you really want to reach out to me, um, send me an email at chris at blackfishent.ca and let's have a chat. If you're interested in moving dirt or doing in pipeline integrity stuff, uh, you want to come work or there's an opportunity there, you can reach me at uh, chris at blackfishindustries.ca. Um, the Unity Corridor, I'll have my email there soon. I'm also a senior fellow with McDonald Laurier, and I, I work with guys like uh, Ken Coates and a wonderful team at MLI that uh, we're, I think we're doing some wonderful things there that will help shape the country. But uh, it's a, it's a, I, I can't stay still on one. <laughs> I, always, I, I always joke with people. I always say, maybe it's my ADD. <laughs> and then, then I just, I got to keep going. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, and I and I really believe that the only disability a person will have is a bad attitude. Um, I, I, I saw that in a quote once, and it resonated with me because uh, I mean I, I I really struggled and I really struggled in school and, and I struggled with math. I struggled with all those things, and it didn't just come overnight. I mean I mean I'm 47 now. It's only these last 10 years that it's really come on where I truly understand, and I got a ways to go yet. Uh, I have some yeah. wonderful people in my corner. You're you're changing gears and getting ready to go. You know, this is just a little bit of a taste of what the the two days of the Indigenous Partnership Success Showcase is going to be about. You're going to be involved, Chris. Like, I can't thank you enough for taking the time today, uh, to, you know, to give people a little bit of a taste of what, what it's like. And so you can see the address on, on the screen there. Uh, please, I encourage anybody who's watching uh, to sign up um, and because... <laughs> It, it will open your eyes in some ways. It will uh, reinforce uh, information that you may already know or understand, but it will also fill in spaces because you're going to be hearing from people who have uh, had success and are showing the way forward. And, and Chris, I think that you are a perfect example of that. I can't, can't thank you enough for taking the time this morning to, to have this conversation with me. Thank you so much, Stuart. And I, I'm really looking forward to the uh, panel that's coming up here Friday. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers throughout this whole uh, uh, showcase. Uh, you're going to see some incredible speakers. My hat's out to, to yourself and the team at ResourceWorks. Uh, Stuart Meir and his entire team. Uh, yes. Ali, if you're, you hear this, uh, thank you so much for always keeping in contact with me and making sure I'm on things because uh, I know I could get sidetracked. Uh, but look, at the end of the day, I've always said together we're stronger, and that's the way we're going to move this country if we start working together. Well, I think your contribution is amazing, Chris. I, I'm fortunate to know you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, a, it's my pleasure. Okay, and to everyone else, uh, enjoy the event. You're, you'll get a lot out of it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.